community can access the content on demand. Please be aware that if you leave your camera on or come off mute at any point, viewers of the recording may be able to see your team's username and your face. If you have any further questions, you can find our data protection statement on the event page on join up. With that out of the way, I suggest we wait one more minute and then see if we have any replies in Slido. Okay, so we're starting to have some replies. So we have Sweden, Germany, Spain, Poland, Spain again, France as well. Belgium, yes. Hungary. OK, maybe now we can pass to the organizations just to to take a quick look at that as well. In Rio, OK. The European Commission, yes, European Commission, Digital Services of Germany, University of West Attica, again, European Commission, which seems to be very popular today. Swedish Agency for Economic and Regional Growth, State Parliament of Salzburg. Thank you for the translation. I would have struggled to read that, actually. Um, OK. Let's give it a couple more seconds and then, then we'll move on. And that spoke for those non-Europeans is a, a county of Austria. <laughs> <laughs> Rec Geno, OK, again, European Commission. Wonderful. With that out of the way, and to keep this on time as well, maybe we can go back to the slides and take a quick look at the agenda for today. So we are already through our welcome and introduction. We'll be done in a couple of minutes. After that, my colleague is just going to quickly address what is digital ready drafting in the meaning of um, tool 28 of the better regulation toolbox. After that, we are going to hear from Pia Andrews for right about 25 minutes on digital rules and digital drafting for a digital economy. Then we will hear from Leanne Hutner for 15 minutes on the Catala project before ending the substantive part of this webinar with a 25-minute Q&A session. Finally, before I turn over to, to my colleague on the next slide, we have a quick explanation for those of you who might not know, know us about who we are. This is our team on the right. We are the Digital Ready Policy Making Team of the European Commission Digit B2. And we are the team behind the Better Legislation for Smoother Implementation, also known as BLSI Community. This is a dynamic and ever-expanding multidisciplinary community on better legislation. Our aim is to share good practices and help co-create tools that have interoperability at the forefront of, of their mind. Some of our favorite topics of focus include digital ready policies, legislation and technology such as this webinar right now, as well as regulatory reporting and streaming set process within the EU. Basically, we're in the business uh, of anything that has something to do with digital ready policy making. And obviously, we also encourage you, if you haven't already, to check our community page on join up. We'll provide the links after the event. And with that, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Isa, who is going to tell us about Tool 28. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aduna. Uh, 
for the floor and uh, welcome to everybody. My name is Isa von Kalben. I'm uh, also in the Commission and part of this Digital Ready Policymaking team um, where we are trying to, to have um, the, com the Commission. On the one side, we are working on the Commission, um, I put, I get, having it on the agenda and, and developing it further. and on the um and with our member states and this global or even a global community then sometimes uh to to push forward and look into interesting ideas and so can we go to the next slide then i will already present <laughs> to you on um uh, there is a, the Com European Commission has a better regulation um, toolbox. There are guidelines and toolbox, and this is how the Commission uh, advises to do policies. And inside this toolbox, we are having a tool on digital ready policy making. And these, and some of you, those who are longer members of our community, will know what we have defined as dig digital ready policy components and enablers, um, because we have talked about this in the past. And um, we have dry and we have um, dived into some of those components more in detail. They are user centric processes ready for automation, or we say, oh, you really need to know your business processes before you do a new policy because you might also want to 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 make them work smoother. Um, that you need to be aligned with all, with the digital uh, policies if you want to become digital ready. Uh, you have to think about once the once only principles so that uh, citizens need to provide their data once only and it can be reused and they get a smooth user journey and don't have to come with the same papers again and again. So you have to think about the reuse of data. You have to think about the evolving ICT landscape and keep it future proof and make, think about reuse. You have to think about innovation and digital technologies. Um, and the last component, digital ready drafting. And this is something actually we have never talked about in, in detail so far in our webinars. And this is why we are diving in, into it today. Um, uh, and But I'm not going to tell you now <laughs> what this is about. But if we can go to the next slide, uh, I will ask first you, what you think, what could this be all about when we talk about digital ready drafting? You already know the context and the context of digital ready policy making. And it's not the, the seven, that's six other things that I've talked about, five other things. <laughs> so what do you think you could please go back to um, Slido and give me first your interpretation. What does digital ready policy uh, drafting entail in your opinion? Or if anybody wants to come in and talk is also okay <laughs> while other people are writing. I don't machine can understand the text. Mm -hmm. Those interested in this, I guess, then they will be uh, get uh, insights on this later in the webinar. Provide for rules that can be used right away. But clear rules that can be easily implemented by machines. Future proofing the text. I fear that the rest of my in, in my intervention will be boring because there's already so much in there <laughs> that we actually have in the text. Uh, simultaneous drafting of human and machine readable rules, like REC available as code to the public, policy twin for all re uh, regulation and legislation. This is already very advanced. <laughs> Reusing existing components, concepts. Taking aspects of implementation and general impacts into account before drafting texts. Structured data set that can be machine translated so that you can hack cool stuff. Yeah, very interesting. And but I, I think in the meaning of time, maybe we we jump to we uh, we take this already as a first teaser. And I have to tell you. Our definition is a bit more modest for now. It's also looking back in time, the toolboxes are now already two years old and maybe we would have written it today, even a bit uh, have more components of this more 
Um, and so it's part of the, I think it's part of the game that really, that things are evolving and it's um, this, to have this in mind because legal text might not evolve that fast. <laughs> so it should allow for this. So um, the, in the European Commission uh, regulation tool, there is no clear definition. Um, but we say, well, there is no, um, we say that it's about setting out clear rules in a legislative act, which is something that you would do. It's not no new rule to that the rule should be clear, <laughs> uh, but those should also be uh, kept future proof to technical development. And then we can maybe already jump to the next slide. Um, so clear rules is of course about quality of language to use simple and precise and concise wording and um, we set out in the text that this is of course was always valid and always um, useful to have clear and precise wording but if a machine is interpreting it or if you have to encode it in a machine it gets even more um, um, urgent that you you really use use unambiguous terms so this part that needs to be automated, are there, it's even, even more um, important. Can we jump to the next slide? So for us, it entails um, that you should, uh, that we, if you want to set up an IT system, you should properly describe it. And um, you should also think about the governance. Normally putting up IT systems is not about a once off exercise, but it's something that is continuous. Um, and do you do you really have include the the necessary provision to to have it to allow for details to be provided at later stage and to be updated and maybe not wait for a regulatory full regulatory amendment to to have technical details um, in the text to so keep it also high level enough uh, that it can that it can evolve with the technical systems but precise enough that you know the governance because for Maybe this is more important in the EU context where you have things that are co-governed, then it's important that this is uh, that you know who will decide about how this system will evolve if it's a system that is shared between many, many actors. Um, does the legal act reuse existing concepts? This is uh, I think there were there were some some of the um, uh, comments before going in this direction. So if you have like a building block <laughs> kind of things that where you really already know that it, when you use the same content, what to accept, and you can also link it to, to technical solutions. Um, this is very useful and uh, good for digital ready drafting. Um, regarding the entry into force, is the timeline realistic from an IT point of view? Because normally you have the text, but then it's still, it, um, I don't know, there is, if you put entry into force 1st of January, this means that the technical system, the first day of the, of the technical system is always critical, but 1st of January, who is working? <laughs> so you need a lot of IT stuff maybe behind a big system that need to ensure that this system is really properly working the first day. So uh, this, is, this, this timing issue when is something just to keep in mind. And does the uh, legal act allow for the use of emerging edge technologies? If you are thinking, for example, of IA, what are the safeguards you would need to put in the legal text? Um, this is something that you should keep in mind. And then also uh, make good. Uh, can you make use of experimentation clauses, maybe regulatory sandboxes? Um, and would the legal act allow for automatic implementation? Because this might also meet, need specific rules around it. And but this also comes back to the things I have before. This might need very clear, um, clear set of rules. And that's all from my side. It's just the teaser of what we understand from it. But we really happy to dive now into the practice and who is already working and learn more of how this can work. Aruna, I give it over to you. Hand over to Thank you, Isa. That was already a very interesting exercise with all the answers. And as you could see from that, it's really difficult to really nail down what digital ready drafting means. It could differ from person to person. And Better Regulation Tool 28 is just one attempt at expressing this and putting it into words. So today we're actually lucky enough to have with us two ladies with experience in the matter who are going to share their view on the topic. 
Firstly, we have Pia Andrews, who is a serial public sector transformer and reformer who has worked in the Australian, New Zealand and Canadian governments and is currently on sabbatical. And second, we have Leanne Hutner, who is an assistant professor in law at University Paris-Saclay and the co-creator of Catala, a domain-specific language designed for annotating legislative text with code that is readable by non-experts. So with that, I'm going to pass the floor to Pia, who is going to take us in the very interesting world of digital-ready drafting for a digital-ready economy. Thank you so much for having me, uh, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, it's an absolute delight and pleasure to be here. Um, the first thing I'll do is just quickly introduce myself before I jump into slides, because I don't want to um, kill you with slides straight away. Um, I have spent the last 25 years working in IT, working in government, working in policy making, working in regulators, and I have a broad range of uh, expertise um, and um, uh, I'm a bit of a, a polymath. So I, I have enough expertise across the entire of the policy life cycle uh, that it's been good to be able to tie all of these pieces together uh, into what you'll see today. My journey with this particular topic, with rules as code, legislation and regulation specifically as code started seven years ago. And just briefly, it started because I was working at a regulator we found that the regulated entities were implementing the regulations in different ways. The regulator, of course, didn't have the resources to go and do a 100% review, and so was spending lots and lots of money on um, you know, risk and profiling technologies to try and figure out which 5% or 4% or 3% of the regulated entities they could ever go and assure. And we started thinking there must be a better way. And we started playing with the idea of what if we made just the prescriptive rules available, not just so that they could consume them, so we could get greater consistency, speed of delivery, uh, all the rest of it, but um, but it also meant that we could then monitor how the rules could be used. And, um, and, on, and on that very humble start, we ended up doing lots of um, work in that regulator. In the New Zealand government, we did um, isomorphic drafting of human and machine readable rules from the start, which actually didn't just result in coded versions of regulations, but it actually resulted in better quality human versions of the regulations because we could take a test-driven approach uh, to what should be prescriptive, what should be principles-based, and where the balance should be. Um, um, and um, and even in that very first little part of the journey, we had um, banks because uh, it was all anti-money laundering, counterterrorism funding regulation. We had just one bank come and tell us that if we made just the prescriptive rules available as code that they could consume and test against, it would save them 16 million a year. So there's been studies here in Australia of the savings, the regulatory savings um, of this idea being in the billions. Um, but I also tend to work a lot in service delivery. And of course, the moment you want to provide integrated services to people, you're having to um, mash together legislation. And, uh, and I'm going to take you on a little bit of that journey um, that that started there. So without further ado, I will now jump into slides. My apologies. Um, but let's take you on a journey of digital rules and digital drafting. Um, two complementary but different concepts um, and how they bring about better policy impact, better consistency compliance, and um, not unsurprisingly, better access to justice in this very unpredictable world. Let's start with how things tend to work in theory. Um, someone has a bright idea, someone does some drafting, once legislation exists online, and let's just, you know, quickly bypass the process by which it gets there, which we all are fairly familiar with, and it is quite complicated. Um, but once you have legislation publicly available in a human readable form, of course, as it generally is, someone needs to know about it, someone needs to interpret it, someone needs to build, you know, business um, uh, requirements around it, um, you know, translate that human version into business requirements, into software, into code, and you end up um, having a reference implementation. Uh, that might be in a government department, for instance. But of course, the reality is that every government department isn't just implementing one uh, legislative instrument, they are um, implementing many. And not only do they have the legislation rules, um, sometimes they have regulatory rules, sometimes they have uh, um, they always actually have operational policy rules that uh, then sit alongside that as well. And what you end up getting is a mashup of rules, some which are authoritative, found in the law, found in legislation, some which are um, inferior in their, um, uh, in their not, not inferior in quality, inferior in authority, 
um, the operational policies of the department. And I can tell you now, I have found many cases around the world now where when you actually unpick the rules that have been implemented into the business systems, into the software systems of government departments, um, those operational policies uh, are wrong um, or conflicting with legislation. Um, or indeed, sometimes we have actually found where the legislative rules have been wrong as well. Uh, we have found several cases where someone built a spreadsheet 30 years ago and that spreadsheet was put into software and, um, and then it's in a black box proprietary piece of software that no one can look at. And um, But no one actually went back to test. Uh, is it actually calculating in the way the legislation explicitly says? And, um, and of course it wasn't. So there are some significant challenges here. In terms of regulation, it's even more complicated because every regulated entity actually does all of that work as well. Because you've only got a human readable version, we are effectively, and you'll excuse my um, slight joke here, but I'm, I'm married to a lawyer and we have lots of interesting conversations at home, but we're kind of using lawyers like modems. They are constantly translating between analog and digital um, and you know business analysts who are doing the same and software developers that are doing the same. We have this multi-layered, myriad forms of con continuous interpretation and reinterpretation of what is said in the legislation into business requirements, which are then translated into myriad business soft, um, software systems, which of course makes it very hard to um, regulate, very hard to monitor and very hard to understand whether the policy impact is being met. In both legisla legislation and regulation, quite often what you end up with is business systems that have a questionable um, uh, impact, um, not just in terms of their intended policy impact, but in terms of unintended impact, uh, particularly when you take into account every organisation is having to um, implement um, across different portfolio instruments, um, uh, policy instruments across different legislation and regulation. Uh, of course, what you're getting is uh, a lot of complexity, which makes it even harder to understand if you're meeting the impact or what unintended impacts you're having. So our current status with how legislation and regulation works is that the drafting process, and this is going to sound a little bit brusque, but please bear with me, is a little bit guest driven. You have people uh, who are absolutely experts, um, best they can be, but they are guessing at what the policy instructions should be. The policy instructions are handed over to the drafters who have the very um, unenviable um, role of translating those policy instructions into actual legislation and regulation. I've seen drafters be given 24 hours to turn a policy instruction around, which is no nowhere near enough time to actually produce something that works. Uh, the regulation that we were working with in anti-money laundering, counterterrorism funding regulation, uh, we found triple negatives across 10 pages of clauses. And when we asked why that was done, the drafter genuinely turned to us eventually, once we'd built a bit of trust with him, and he said, look, I'm, I was just having a bad year that year. <laughs> you do get quite inconsistent drafting. You do get inconsistent um, um prose, I guess, that, that then someone else needs to interpret. So it's fairly guest-driven in process. It's very inefficient. Inefficient in that no matter how much time or effort or how much you try to make more efficient the drafting process itself, it's inefficient in that the moment it's publicly available, all of the onus of effort and interpretation and codification and implementation is on, is on the back end, which means that if the people doing the implementing of those rules of that legislation regulation into actual software systems, which of course everything has to happen eventually, um, if they find any issues or conflicts or logic flaws, there's no way to feed that back up into, um, into the process because it's already gone through the parliament. So you, they end up just making do best they can. You end up with a, um, a lot of time and effort and money um, that goes into it. And of course, because we all got quite enamoured by the concept of principles-based regulation and, and legislation a couple of decades ago, that's even increased the, um, the, the cost and effort and onus of, um, of effort on regulated entities, creating a uh, opportunity for the larger ones, but uh, locking up small ones and, and certainly creating a um, productivity issue for the economy. You get inconsistent um, outcomes, of course, because everyone that's implementing often don't have access to the policy team that instructed it in the first place. So if the policy says, if the legislation says for every working week, you must blah, what do you mean by working week? This is a this is a genuine case that happened in New Zealand that we worked with where they had a, um, a regulation that governed holiday pay. And the regulation literally said for every working week pay X, Y, Z. And everyone, of course, interpreted working week differently. 
Is that five times eight? Is it five times 7.5? Is it 40 hours? Is it 37.5 hours? What happens if a person has multiple jobs? What happens if a person is working two full-time job equivalents? Um, the inconsistency in New Zealand around that, around that one term working week led to tens of millions of mispayments being made, including in the agency that was ostensibly responsible for the um, uh, administration of that piece of regulation. Ineffective policy outcomes. If you're all introducing many, many variables and you don't have a test driven approach in the first place and you don't have a closed loop approach to the policy management where the not just the policy impact, but the unintended impacts are being monitored for and patterns of uh, impact are being monitored for. If you if you haven't predefined, here are some tests about a person with these situation, you know, with these conditions should get this outcome or a family with these conditions should pay this much tax or a business with these um, characteristics has these obligations. If you haven't predefined those tests, then how do you know if the output of a business system is actually meeting the original intent? It's, um, it's fairly tricky, but the final part of this, of course, is we end up with uh, a slightly untrustworthy situation. Uh, anyone who is leveraging those rules, whether it's a government department with legislation or a regulated entity with regulation, uh, anyone that's leveraging those rules, the rules are not visible to anyone. There's very little oversight, particularly because a lot of the rules are going into business systems that are not uh, that are then bound up by um, uh, commercial and confidence. Um, and, uh, and and are bound by other contractual obligations. So you end up trusting what comes out of the software <laughs> or having to trust what comes out of the software, which makes it inherently untrustworthy. If you can't test the outputs of your system back against what the law says, then it is very possible. And I'm sad to say that we have found in many countries, you, you get unlawful outputs. So if you couple all of that, that challenge with the current status, um, if you combine that, all of those challenges with the fact that we have just a explosion in new technologies, an explosion of new, yes, opportunities, but also challenges, then um, it, it gets even more complicated. So uh, because th there's a new consideration that, that needs to be taken into account, which is that shaping society and the economy is no longer about just shaping human behavior. We now have uh, DAOs, we have AI, we have... Um, machines that are interacting with systems, with people, um, with um, um, with each other, <laughs> that are not going to be bound by legal, financial or criminal levers. So unless we actually establish the incentives in the systems that we build, in the economies that we administer, in the regulations, then we end up with machines uh, operating potentially very, very differently to how a human might um perform uh, and um, and a lot of our regulators and a lot of our drafters are still often starting from the presumption of uh, human behavior being and, and human incentives and disincentives being the basis of um, of driving change. So in this way, rule makers actually need to consider machines as users. This picture is a real picture of um, AI generated fake people. Uh, it is a good case that it looks very real, doesn't it? You look into each one of their eyes and you think you're looking at a real person, but these are all completely fake. Um, and we all know that we're just on the tip of the iceberg, but I will get into that point. So for today's talk, I thought that I'd cover three topics that I thought might be directly and immediately helpful to you in understanding not just where this concept has evolved to because over the last decade there has been a lot of movement in this space a lot of opportunities a lot of testing and experimentation and um and intelligence that has been built up over a, a um a global community looking at uh, not just digital regulation and legislation but looking at um test-driven drafting of digital first legislation and regulation. So the three things we'd look, I thought we'd look at, how might we ensure effective, efficient and traceable adoption of legislation and regulation in a digital economy? Number two, we're going to look at how we can design and continuously improve test-driven legislation and regulation that are fit for the digital age. Uh, and number three, we're going to look at how might we build trustworthy systems in the age of AI, because it is a, a, a genuine challenge. <laughs> so number one, so if we think again about this idea of um, um, rather than just having an idea and then making machine uh, human readable legislation, if we generated human and machine readable legislation from the start, 
then and that doesn't mean just write the human version and then translate it into machine but actually having the human like the people sitting down side by side to co-draft isomorphically draft human and machine readable rules uh, i'll get to how we're going to do that later but when you have a digital version of your legislation and regulation available, even if, you know, for existing um, uh, regulation and legislation, obviously you're just having to code what already is there. So I'll get to the future state in a minute. But if you had api.legislation.gov.xx, uh, you know, insert your country here, then everyone can be consuming the same rules in the same way. It's not, um, and, and just to quickly preempt a question, um, a lot of people talk about authority. Um, there are a lot of different thoughts about this where I and frankly most of the people that are serious in the space have come to is that the human readable would be the only legal authority and the technical version, the coded machine readable version of legislation regulation would be at best a highly trusted reference implementation in the same way that we make reference implementations available for many other aspects of governance. Uh, we can have a reference implementation and then and you don't even need to make it mandatory. You can say, here's a reference implementation, choose it if you want. Most companies, most government agencies will use uh, a reference implementation because it's the easiest thing to use. And if one chooses to not use it, that gives you a bit of a red flag as to why they're choosing to not use the reference implementation when we know it costs so much uh, to maintain and update their own. Let's go and have a look at whether they found a loophole or whether they found something strange. In any case, you end up with lots of business systems using the same rules and then the outputs of those systems being able to generate traceable records. You know, this decision or this output was based on this law and here's a reference back to that law. But it also means those outputs can be tested for lawfulness. Uh, it also means you can then monitor how the rules are being used. You can say um, out of the whole of this particular uh, act, um, 90% uh, of the rules are being used as expected, but 10% are not being used at all. Why is that? Are they not being invoked because they're not necessary, uh, because there's a closed um, logic uh, somehow, uh, because you know our assumptions about their utilisation uh, were wrong? Um, you can start to predefine patterns of usage, and then if something, um, uh, if 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 an entity actually starts invoking the rules in an unintended way, in an um, in a unusual pattern, again, it gives you some uh, a reason to be able to go and investigate. So all these things start to give you little red flags to be able to look at. Which rules are useful to to encode? Um, prescriptive rules are the number one. Um, so eligibility thresholds, calculations, obligations, definitions, uh, anything which is prescriptive is a really useful thing to provide a reference implementation as code. Um, um, and, and you would think that uh, certain definitions would be really simple, things like a person needs to be over 18. But interestingly, even something as basic as, you know, a person has to be over 18 is still up to the interpretation of a developer when it's put into a business system. So if you can create a reference implementation, you get more consistency, but you also maintain maximum equity. As uh, To go back to the example, uh, if the legislation says you need to be over 18, do you count it from midnight of the of the day, you know, of the morning of your birthday? Do you count it from midnight the day after? Because that's, you know, that 24 hours might lock out, you know, tens of thousands or, or of people in a country um, to have access to that help uh, or, or for that tax or for that condition or for whatever. So these things can actually make quite a significant difference, even when they're quite small. Um, in code, you don't tend to codify principles, of course, because the whole point of a principle is that you want to maintain human judgment. But what you would do is put into your into your software, into your rules as code system, something like um, um, eligibility equals X, Y, and Z. You know, after you've done X, Y, and Z, then you still need to meet a character test. And so the software would still know that you're not actually eligible until you've done the character test, but here are the print, uh, here's the uh, prescriptive based rules around that. And at this point you need to invoke um, the principle. The other part of it that, that was quite interesting and particularly working at the regulator is precedents emerge over time. We just assumed that they would not want, um, that the the uh, policy owners and compliance uh, officers would not want us to codify um, anything which is principles based, anything which is judgment based. But what they came back to us and said was actually, once a precedent emerges, you know, a company with these characteristics is definitely exempt or a company with these characteristics is definitely considered a regulated entity. Being able to codify those precedents uh, and, you know, as they emerge actually provided then a, uh, an efficiency opportunity and, again, consistency opportunity. You don't want a situation where 
um, once a judgment is made, it's being overridden for um, and creating potential inequitable outcomes. So what are rules code? So just to be clear, rules as code are machine readable version of the legislation regulation. It's not just machine readable, it's machine consumable. It's managed independently from other systems and rules. The moment that you take legislation and regulation and mash it up with other systems and rules, you create a potential conflict within a system where a non-legislative or regulatory rule might conflict with or override your authoritative rules, your legislation and regulation. Ideally, it's available as a utility consumable by all. And, um, and ideally, your pure rules as code is also complemented by test suites. So something like a person with these characteristics should get this outcome, a company with these characteristics should have these obligations, et cetera. Um, and ideally, you'd also have infrastructure to support the whole policy journey, but I'll get more onto that a little bit later. What are not rules as code? This is really important because a lot of people are jumping on this bandwagon now. There's a lot of companies and people and organizations around the world who are like, yeah, yeah, we're doing rules as code. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're doing policy as code. But it is not where you just automate law. It is not just structured content. There's a lot of um, um, parliamentary council officers uh, that have been told by their vendor that, um, oh yeah, yeah, well we we already um, can we already have rules as code in your legislation um, management system, but it's actually just XML. They're just making it machine st like structured. Um, it's not an interpretational translation engine. There are a lot of pieces of software that say, yeah, yeah, feed your, your legislation in here and it will pop out with rules. The moment you do that, particularly if it's machine learning based um, translation engine, you might get a different thing pop out each time, <laughs> which then starts to contradict um, rule of law. It starts to contradict uh, administrative law and you get some, some serious huge issues where you're leaving the interpretation up to a machine, but there's no accountability or traceability or um, um, explainability of how that interpretation has worked. So you can't just have something which is translating on the fly all the time. It's not an AI, it's not a website. Um, there are many, many examples. That, these are just some that I have personally worked on with teams from Australia, New Zealand and Canada. Uh, we've built lots of entitlements engines, of course, because service delivery is a, just a really, really important case around this, um, whether it's um, entitlements, whether it's taxation, whether it's rebates, anything which is, you know, um, eligibility calculation based, um, uh, highly um, prescriptive based is exceptionally good for this. But, but it didn't just provide us a way to provide integrated services. It also provided us a way to then automate the validation of an output of a business system. So when a system creates a decision, we can then say, OK, let's test that, you know, test the inputs and outputs of that system against the legislation as code. And suddenly we've got a, a mechanism for ensuring that anything that our government services is doing is actually lawful. Uh, better modelling of change and reform, of course. There are a number of policy difference engines popping up in New South Wales. We um, did actually do uh, isomorphic drafting, and that was a really great uh, case study because the policy and drafting folk did not see any benefit in this um, sort of idea of drafting in human and machine readable forms from the start. But what we were able to show them in just half a day was um, their assumptions about how the regulations would be implemented um, we could very quickly code that up, run the scenarios and show them that actually there's a whole bunch of ways to reverse engineer and, and game and frankly get a different outcome than your intended outcome. Uh, and some of their assumptions had led to com uh, internal conflicts and logic and all kinds of other things. So code drafting, they were able to very quickly see that they got better human version of the drafting at the same time as getting a machine readable version that they then could launch new services, new self-assessment tools, um, and, and provide um, a, a reference implementation for regulated entities to leverage straight away. It was very helpful. There are a number of governments around the world, including New South Wales, that have uh, started building LLMs with their case law, with their gazettes, and with their legislation. The challenge, of course, is that an LLM gives you a way to um, to in, uh, interact with the content, but it still doesn't give you machine consumable, but it can complement. So if you take, for instance, your case law as an LLM and then complement it with legislation regulation as code, you now have a fairly interesting way to be able to look at the past and, and interrogate the past a little bit and look for patterns in the past, but also to be ensure that any decisions that come out of a system is validated against what the law actually says. And then, of course, there's a lot of opportunities around compliance and regulation, as I've mentioned. 
I mentioned the, the AMLCTF uh, example. Um, water regulations in New Zealand, they've gone through a whole project of um, uh, rules as code and providing all of their regulatory rules, reporting rules, um, standards and such as code as a way to streamline and automate uh, the water regulatory uh, compliance requirements. There's huge amounts of work happening in this with international trade and I can put you in touch with um, people that are working in that space and of course lots of other services like rates rebate. So here's what we found was before you even start drafting, before you even start coding, actually getting people around the table to say, and, and this is where multi or cross-disciplinary teams is absolutely crucial. You cannot do better rules, not just rules as code, but you can't do, you can't create better rules unless you have different disciplines in the in the room. So we found when we had the policy folk, the drafters, the um, uh, software developers and design folk in the same room at the same time, then the um, and and ideally you would actually have end users or or people affected by a um, particular regulation as well. <clears throat> so we had a software developer from a um, payroll company involved in in one of our um, in one of our experiments, for instance. When you have that that cross disciplinary um, team. You can actually go through and plot out the logic of a of a idea. Okay, here's how it's supposed to work. Here's who's going to be involved. Here's how it's going to be paid. Here are the conditions. Here are the and and just plotting it out into a concept model, even though it's just sort of flowcharty, it makes sure you get everyone on the same page. And then after that, you can then build a legislative version. You could do a pseudocode version if you want, because it sort of helps you define what's useful or not, and a software code version that you could then run through modeling and other opportunities. So these things were drafted, not one, then the other, then the other. These things were drafted simultaneously with back and forth between the drafter and the developer um, to actually identify, well, what do you mean by this term? Well, what does this mean? And what, is, you know, and, and it creates enormous opportunities. There were lots of findings of this particular research project. Um, this is this research project is Oh, well, there you go. 2018, so five years ago now, and um, and it's been the basis of a lot of um, uh, ongoing research around um, uh, not just legislation, regulations, code, but also this co-drafting approach. Um, and the key outcomes that came out of that not were not just that if you don't consider the fact that new policy, new legislation is inevitably going to be implemented into software. So if you don't have some of that expertise in the room in the drafting process, then so, you know you quite often can get rules that are not um, easy to build into software without making a lot of assumptions, which may or may not align with your policy intent. Multidisciplinary teams were key. Co-designing the rules and definitions um, gave a, a far better chance of getting effective uh, implementation. And um, and there were a lot of it, it sped up service delivery substantially. It sped up an automated integrated service delivery substantially. And there was a lot of opportunities around um, the fact that common frameworks would be useful, but they don't exist at all at the moment. And we also identified, of course, that not all legislation is suitable for machine consumption, um, but um, but there was, it was suitable for a lot. Uh, I'll just skip that. So with principles, one of the key things is that. Um, there has been this huge shift towards principles over the last few decades. And I think the key lesson that's come out of all of that is that there's a place for both. Um, it's not that it should all be principles, but it should definitely not be all prescriptive either. The key thing is that principles is great where judgment is needed and prescriptive is great where consistency is needed. And so um, you always need a combination of both and taking this test-driven approach to drafting helps you achieve both. So how might we design and continuously improve test-driven legislation? Well, if you start with this concept modeling approach and then you co-draft a human and machine readable version using a test-driven human-centered design approach and also producing a test suite, um, you know, this regulation uh, should be about privacy. Here's a bunch of scenarios about um, what actions should be taken in the event of X, Y, and Z. Um, so now you've got a, a, a human readable version, a machine readable version, and a couple of test scenarios, which you can then use as part of the normal um, consultation phase. So regulators already have, legislators already have a consultation phase as part of the process of new legislation. What we found in Canada was that we could use the exact same consultation phase to just consult on the coded version at the same time. People take the machine, the human readable version and give comment on it. There's no reason why providing a machine implementation at the same time, um, it, it, that was 
allowable under their interpretation of um, of how that uh, phase should work. And so we were able to use that uh, to, um, to to generate a more test driven approach with the um, consumers of these rules as well. And then, of course, the human readable version would be enacted by Parliament. And the API and test suite could be immediately available, which then reduces time and cost, you know, all, all the benefits that I've, I've been talking about. So better rules is isomorphic drafting. What it produces is a, uh, and there's a bunch of examples here uh, where isomorphic drafting has resulted in some substantial benefits for those jurisdictions. Um, and one of the ideal outcomes here is that we end up with a, a policy twin. We ended up with a shared interpretation, a shared digital interpretation of legislation and regulations code, which then allows us to model and understand complexity across the domain, not just within a particular act or within a particular portfolio. Better rules is not just doing a bit of design at the front or just a bit of better evaluation or just a bit of concept mapping. It actually has to um, produce at the end of the day, both human and machine readable versions and needs to produce at the end of the day, something that can um, be used by machines. Um, so I've spoken a bit about the benefits, so I might just jump forward a little bit. I'm sure there's a few questions. Um, one of the challenges we have in um, government, and this is now around government use of its own rules, government use of legislation, is that every team involved in the policy journey, whether it's policy, delivery, or evaluation, or the people affected by it, everyone has their own tooling, their own interpretation of policy, their own uh, view, their own monitoring, uh, their own methods and systems and reports and all the rest of it. One of the goals that, that I have come to after seven, eight years working in this space is the realisation that if we could actually have shared and uh, strategic policy infrastructure, then suddenly we could actually have uh, a greater um, realization of policy outcome because the same way that it's imagined is the way that it's implemented. Uh, and we start to reduce the variables and the inconsistencies and the reinterpretations in between. Uh, we start to create an opportunity where you don't just have an idea and then, and then you know, get into drafting, uh, you know, get into policy instructions and then drafting. But people can actually play with, if you like, a fork of um, the policy twin. You could you could have anyone say, okay, well, if, if here's the current regulations and legislation as code, what if I make this change? What if I um, make this change? What if in the future you could say uh, to your, you know, AI helper, um, I want to make this change. Go and you know model me five different options. Uh, like there are so many opportunities where you can actually get a, um, a whole of policy as code. Uh, environment and when you can combine that with open modeling tools, monitoring tools, escalation tools, et cetera, and bringing all of the lessons learned and smarts that have gone into the shift towards human centered and um, um, continuous improvement in service delivery, bringing all of those smarts and end to end management into policy delivery. How will this change things? How could it change things? I guess is more the question. Once we I mean, I could say if we, but I do think that this is inevitable at some point. Once we collectively draw a line in the sand, then we can get better drafting of legislation, regulation, and the operational rules, frankly, of government. We could have the ability for anyone or any machine to consume those rules confidently. We could have immediate availability of consumer rules upon enactment, automated compliance, automated monitoring, patterns, analysis, et cetera, cross-agency integration, um, and greater accountability, traceability of systems, including AI, we could improve fundamentally trust in public institutions in terms of legislative um, legislation implementation, but also, of course, improve trust in private institutions in regulation implementation. So this brings me to the final part of my presentation. How do we build trustworthy systems in the age of AI? So rules as code provides a real, <laughs> not a fluffy, a real guardrail for artificial intelligence. What do I mean by that? Here is one of my favorite videos on the internet at the moment. It's a video that shows ChatGPT playing against Stockfish. Stockfish is a chess engine, a rules-based chess engine. And of course, you all know what ChatGPT is, generative AI that has no rules. And if anyone, I mean, I would hope some of you would know this. I'm a, um, a bit of a chess nerd. Um, but what um, black is ChatGPT, Stockfish is white. Uh, Stockfish, of course, has had a... Um, um, has moved diagonally at some point, but uh, ChatGPT, after watching some games, is like, oh, I can move my pawn diagonally from the start, even though it didn't take a piece. Now, 
Of course, that's not true because, and this is the point, generative AI will mimic what it, you know, what it sees without understanding at all the context or the rules or anything. It doesn't think, it's not a logic engine. It doesn't, uh, doesn't follow any rules. It just mimics what it sees. It is at best a synthesis engine. So, but imagine if you took generative AI and combined it with rules-based engines, combined it with legislation and regulation as code, combined it with rules as code, um, then ChatGPT in this instance could be testing its moves against a rules um, engine, against the rules to say, here are the 40 moves that I want to make, which ones are illegal? <laughs> and it could effectively um, not, and even though that might take, you know, a few more nanoseconds, because of course computers are very, very fast, at least it ensures that it won't actually make a move that is illegal. And you can see how that could extend out to everything from service delivery to regulation. So decision-making systems need guardrails. Decision-making systems can be machine learning or rules ba uh, machine learning based or rules based. We've had rules based machines for for since we've had computers. Uh, it's been the implementation of machine learning that's been a trick. But machine learning based ADM, sorry, I'll just be another couple of minutes, um, is riskier in the special context of government because it's difficult to comply with administrative law. So lawfulness of government requires legislation as code and testing against legislation. Effective regulation um, involves consuming regulation as code, and fairness involves measuring for impact. Okay, so I will stop there. I've got some notes there for another conversation another day about act actual guardrails. I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of the guardrails that people call guardrails for AI end up being signage. You know, watch out for this the thing, be ethical, you know, think about things, but nothing's actually stopping people running off a cliff, whereas regulation as code and legislation as code could help you run off the cliff. So I'll stop there. There's um, a whole project around policy infrastructure that's going on in Australia right now. If you are interested, we can loop you in, but we are building out what the entire policy infrastructure to manage policy end-to-end -end could look like, which of course includes not just legislation, regulation as code and test suites, but also LLMs for gazettes. Um, I will stop there with um, one last thing. There is an OECD working paper on uh, better rules and legislation as code, and I will leave you with the thought of... Coming back to here, I will leave you three thoughts. Digital legislation and regulation available to the public provides opportunities. Uh, number two, isomorphic drafting with multidisciplinary teams gets better rules. Um, we need to reform the policy journey to get to ensure that we're driving policy outcomes. And we need to rethink what policy infrastructure looks like end to end. Thank you so much for your time. I hope that was helpful and I'll pass over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pia. That was absolutely amazing. I see that we already have quite a few questions, but I propose we give the floor to Leanne and then we'll address them as a gathered field at the end. So Leanne, please go go ahead. Thank you. Let me just share. Uh, wait a second. Um, wait. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, okay, great. Um, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you, Pia, for, uh, for this presentation. So I'm Leanne and I am a legal scholar and assistant professor in digital law at the University Paris-Saclay. And so I'm gonna, so I, my background is really completely in law. I'm a lawyer, I don't have I'm not a computer scientist. However, I've been working with computer scientists for a long time now on coding the law and on different aspects of digital law. And so what I want to do today is share one of our projects on translating law to code with um, a perspective, with a legal perspective, because that's that's where I stand. Um, and so in a way, I think it, what, what I'm going to present today is a bit of a of an alternative to what Pia has presented, because we have been working for years now on law that is absolutely not digital ready. And we have been working on how to actually produce code from that, but not just produce code, produce fair code and transparent code and code that is um, compatible with data protection law and administrative law and this kind of, this kind of uh, like general um, framework. Um, and so what I'm going to do is first I'm going to introduce to you the Catala project for you to understand a bit where we stand and then I would like to 
draw the conversation on interdisciplinarity because that is i mean that's one of the i think central central of the idea of the of the digital ready drafting project but also what what p has said so i think i'd like to to talk about my experience with interdisciplinarity when we talk about uh, computer science and the law and so as you know a lot of laws today are already uh, translated into code um, because that's the way government implemented. For example, in France, we have um, tax law. We also have social security pensions that are calculated by algorithm that are supposed to translate the law. And for example, um, that it can look like this. So this is a, a part of the algorithm that translates um, the calculation of the income tax in France. Uh, it's over 100K lines of code. And as you see, it's pretty impossible to understand, even if you have a PhD in computer science, which uh, most of us who are really uh, concerned about uh, tax law are not, do not have. And so the Catala project started with this. We, we understood that this was the case, this was, was, was happening, and that was not just in for tax law, but also, um, as I said, for social benefits and pensions and, and this kind of things. And so we wanted to try to think about a way for to, to transform this into something that is much more human readable and then we can check with how it is in conformity with, with the law. And so we had, um, we had different ideas. The first one was we need to have an algorithm that is accurate that is really um, similar to the law and we can check it. We need to have an algorithm that is transparent. That is, we need to have as many people as possible that are allowed or able to understand it and check it and maybe check if there is no mistake and want to have accountability from the part of the administration that produces these algorithms. And all this obviously goes together. It's also really, and that's where maybe I come from, um, it was a very strong perspective on that. It's also, similar to the idea of privacy by design and fairness by design that are really important in digital law, which means when we create an algorithm or a data processing that treats personal data and has an impact on people, we really need to do it in a way that is um, in conformity with human rights and allows uh, accountability and transparency. Um, but obviously, when you have law that is not digital ready, it's not that easy. And so here I have a, a section of the US tax code because we have also worked on, uh, on American law, on US law. Um, and when you, you have this kind of law, it's, it's, first of all, it's really difficult to understand. And second, it's quite difficult to translate into, um, into code. So it's not digital ready and it requires high expertise both in computer science and the law. And Obviously, the way it is, the way the administration is built, the structure, it, this is not this is not really made for that. And so we took that as a fact. We we know the law exists in that way. We know we're not going to change it because we're not going to change the entire tax law in the, in the U.S. or in France. But we still want to make sure that when it is implemented, it is done in an accurate way, in a transparent way, and in an accountable way. And so the main idea that we have is not to change the law, but to adapt the code to the law. And maybe digital ready regulation could be interesting in the future, but for the law that we already have, it's gonna be really difficult to change it. So what we offer is an alternative to digital ready regulation for this kind of uh, situation. And so we did that um, using several tools. The first thing that we did was create a domain specific computer language for the law. A domain specific computer language is a computer language that was created for a specific purpose. So as you know, computer languages are the way we interact with computers. Uh, we can use HTML for coding um, um, website, we can use Java and Python and all these kind of ways for us to tell the computer what to do. But in some instance, in some disciplines, we need a computer language that is really specific, that is created for a very specific purpose. There is, for example, a specific one for music. And so we felt that creating a specific computer language for the law would allow us to do many things that another kind of technique wouldn't allow us. Um, so this is 
an example of Catala, of the specific domain specific language that we created. And as you see, when you, I come back to the first slide, um, which we have, which is the algorithm that is used today, it's quite different. So because it is a specific domain specific computer language, we were able to really adapt it to the law, to the structure of the law, but also to lawyers. So we are using words that I chose because I am a lawyer and I'm like one of the main lawyer working in the project. And I said, look, this is how the law is structured. This is how we understand the law. We use the word scope, we use definition, we use condi conditions and these kind of things. And this is what I want to see in the code because that's the way I'm gonna understand it. So we're using these keywords that are um, completely machine readable and machine usable because we have a compiler that translates them into what the machine can do. So these are the green ones. And then we also use, we, we use really the, the variables and the function that are written in the code, in the, in the, in the, sorry, in the, in the tax law. So for example, when we talk about qualified employee discount, we use the word qualified employee discount. And in the current, um, framework what they use is like I R N I I N. It's like this kind of variable are translating the ones that we have in the law. So we didn't want to do that. We really wanted to keep the vocabulary to make sure that people understand it and the lawyer understand it. And then we use really simple um, ways to 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 write it. Like for example, if if you read here, I mean if employee discount is um, superior to a certain amount, then we have a condition that applies. This is something that even if you don't have a, com a degree in computer scientist, in computer science, sorry, you can understand. And this is really what was very important for us. And so it might take a bit of time to understand it, but we've, it's a, we've tested it with my students and normally after an hour of discussion and question and explanations, students can understand it and can also check if there, is, um, if there are mistakes in the code or not. We are also using a specific kind of, um, of logic, which is logic by default, which is really adapted to the structure of statutes, which allow us to put, to put conditions and then come back on them. And that is quite unique in um, the role S code movement. Um, so this um, language, this domain specific language for the law, allow us to really translate in, in existing statutes into code that is reviewable, transparent, because it is open source and understandable by lawyers. But one of the main idea of Catala is that we need to have an interdisciplinary uh, work. And that is achieved through what we called interdisciplinary pair programming. So pair programming is something that computer scientists do a lot, which is they work together on one code, one of the computer scientists write the code and the, the other one checks, and then they discuss it together. So the way we do it is in Catala is that we write code together, lawyers and computer scientists. And this is interdisciplinary pair programming. So the way it works is the following. We take a piece of the law, often it takes us an hour for an article, but sometimes it can be quicker when, uh, when it's a very easy article and can be much longer for um, the most difficult sections of uh, the tax code, which are not rare. So we sit together, we put the article of the law, we read it, we make sure everyone agrees on what it means, and often the lawyer explains uh, what it means to the computer scientist, and then they discuss it, and the computer scientist says, yeah, but for example, how do we calculate the date? And then the lawyer says, okay, I'm going to check with case law, I'm going to check with policies, I'm going to check with what the administration asks. And sometimes we even call the administration, and we say, well, we're not sure about this interpretation, how do you think we should do that? And then we write it together. So the computer scientist writes it in Catala using this language. He explains what he's doing to the lawyer, and then the lawyer checks and continues to discuss. And so this way, we have a law that is completely, a code, sorry, that is completely adapted to the law. And we always take the language, the tra translation of the law, and we put it just under the text itself. This way, when it changes, when it evolves, which happens all the time in tax law and social security benefits and pensions, we make sure that we can change it quite easily, which allows us for really better maintenance. Um, I have done quite a lot of interdisciplinary pair programming, and it, it has 
taught, teach me, like taught me a lot about my uh, discipline, about the law, because sometimes you see it through completely other lenses when you uh, work with a computer scientist. It's also extremely interesting. I've learned so much on how computer works and what is accountability in digital, um, in the digital era and digital sphere. It's also extremely fun because we um, we really feel like we're producing something that is uh, important, that has uh, strong values because it can um, change the way the law is implemented. But we also do it in the way we want to do it. And so I think that's one of the main uptake of the Ketala project, which means that if we create tools to work together interdisciplinary, me meaning with lawyers and scientists, and sometimes even further away with uh, people from social sciences, we can really do create technologies that are in line with the law, with data protection, with the law, and often with values that are important when we create that. Um, and so that's it for me. Um, the main idea is really not to adapt the law to the code, but to adapt the code to the law and to do it uh, with people from uh, different uh, expertise. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now we have around right about 20 minutes. And I think we can take use that time to to answer some questions that we have in the chat. If you'd like, please raise your hands and then you can also ask questions verbally. We'll we'll call upon you. Sophia. No, sorry, I just try to lower my hand and now I just <laughs> waving all around. But in any case, I would like to thanks to both speakers because I found it super interesting and and uh, I can jump on already at the interdisciplinary but maybe then I just I started typing a question so I start with that uh, to Lian uh, I'm also not an IT expert so the question might be super silly if Catala is a kind of specialized uh, computer language let's say then can it be easily understood by um, any computer so if I, a business wants to take it up uh, does it need some learning because I guess this would be the intention that you create some kind of authentic reference implementation like I heard from uh, Pia and then you wish to offer it that more and more people use it so how, how do you achieve that? Um, well, thank you for your question well first of all it's quite easy for computer scientists to learn it because it's an easy language but you can also compile it to any other languages that you want because we have a tool that do that so it's it should be quite uh, straightforward. Issa, do you want to ask a question as well? Um, yes, maybe. Uh, also, thank you very much. It was so, so interesting, and I would love to, <laughs> to have a longer conversation uh, with you. Um, actually, we have um, a legal proposal currently discussed um, with Parliament and Council on it's the, called the Interoperable Europe Act, and there we have an um, obligation to do interoperability assessments. And actually for this, you have to look in legal texts also for requirements for technical systems. So I would wanted to ask to the two of you, um, how do you explain people that these, these texts contain requirements for technical systems? And uh, for I mean, the first step would just be this, this awareness raising. Do you have any methodology? Do you have any practical tips on this? Because this is like, um, we feel that of this whole, then once you have you have them out and in Catala, then it's easy to see how they would, or Catala is an example to with the, the impacts. But once they are still in the text, they are hard, sometimes hard to grasp. Um, so that's my question. Um, Pierre, do you want to answer maybe? I think that's maybe more in your... Oh, sorry, I thought that was a specific question to you. I'm so sorry. Would you repeat the question? I, uh, my, the, question? the question on, on the on the requirement, my question, or was it uh, the, the one from Sophia? Um, the question you want me to answer. <laughs> uh, okay, yes, you're, yeah, you're but how do you... I, uh, how do you find requirements in legal text? So when ah. you, I mean you you don't you say you're not Sorry. translating the full text. How do you train people to to find that this is the part that you need to translate? All right, right. Um, okay, so there's a couple of things here. First of all, business requirements are, and and this is going to uh, I'm going to say something a bit revolutionary. So please bear with me. Business requirements are an indicator that you have a problem because they 
what happens at the moment is you have someone over here doing the interpretation and then throwing business requirements over the over the fence to the IT and whether it's outsourced or insourced, these people are only given business requirements to implement. They don't actually have any say in how those business requirements are developed. When you have a genuinely cross-disciplinary team, you can actually do this quite differently. You actually work it through together. You're effectively building the business requirements, for want of a better word, together, and you're building the coded version together. Uh, to, to your point about which parts do they encode or not, any piece of legis like any piece of legislation that needs to be implemented, you work like it, it, sorry, there's two different parts here. If you're starting from a piece of legislation that's already written or regulation that's already written, as you work through it, it becomes very clear what needs to be implemented or not. Um, if it is a judgment, you still put in the code, and at this point, a judgment is needed. Have you have you met this condition? Yes or no? And it's always going to be set as no by default until the judgment um, uh, condition has been met or not, right? But the rules that then are prescriptive, you then put in the prescriptive rules. So you you still need to have everything in your rules as code. It's just that the judgment based ones are you're not presuming or defining. Your those ones are at this point you need a human to make a judgment. Um, and so, but what's helpful is you can still say to people, but here are the requirements you need before you bother, like um, before you bother booking in to get an interview, for instance. So in the case of the citizenship example I gave, uh, what we found was people were booking to get a citizenship interview because, of course, the judgment there is that you have to pass a good character test in New Zealand. Um, but um, but people were then turning up and they hadn't actually met the prescriptive rules yet. So being able to reverse the parity of that and saying, let's make the prescriptive rules public and, and easily available and people can self-assess, oh, do I even meet the requirements before I go to the interview? And then suddenly we were able to free up capacity and free up resource and free up, you know, people's time as well, which is quite helpful. So um, it, 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 in terms of those kinds of rules, it makes sense. Where you start is with high volume services, high volume regulation is a good place to start. But I think if you spend a couple of years trying to figure out where to start, then you're probably missing a couple of years of getting things done. <laughs> um, so um, the, the most important thing is to just start where you've got value. And where I have found significant value in all the teams and projects I've been involved in is in service delivery by government and high volume prescriptive regulation. Paul, please. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, or for your presentations. I think they are really uh, interesting and important. Uh, I have uh, a few questions uh, in particular to, uh, to PR related to the policy infrastructure. Um, so uh, what, what I think is needed in terms of, uh, of um, those people that are actually writing the laws is a culture change. Yeah? And I would like to know a little bit more about how uh, you reached that culture change in order to make this all happen. Um, related to this uh, is uh, how mature do you think is the shared policy infrastructure? And how did you prepare the stakeholder community to actually be able to consume uh, the, um, the code that you are uh, making available? Because one thing is to create all this beautiful infrastructure and, uh, and 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 have this beautiful vision, which I think is really cool. Um, but another thing is to actually um, use its full potential. And I would like to know a little bit about uh, that. For sure. Also, Those, oh. yeah. No, go so, ahead. Uh, okay. And then, um, and, and uh, uh, related to that is uh, is the public consultation actually using also also this code? So it's a bit related uh, to to the question before. And uh, in your assessment, uh, is this type of approach suitable for the different legal systems that we have uh, in the world? So you know, the the, the Anglo uh, Anglo Saxon uh, system is different than uh, in in some countries. So uh, I can imagine that some legal systems are easier, uh, uh, are a better target for this type of approach than, than others. So thanks a lot for, for any suggestions that you have. And I'm also looking forward to the comments and questions from uh, the colleagues in the, uh, in the legal service, because I think that this is uh, really interesting also for the Commission. Thank you.
Um, those were four very big questions, um, so I'm going to do my best. <laughs> um, first of all, on culture. It, here is an interesting observation for you. Governments used to be structured around outcome. You used to have, here is the outcome, and um, which is a cost center, which then has all of the disciplines needed to drive that outcome. One of the unfortunate unintended, I would suggest, impacts of new public management, which I, of course affected some governments very strongly and didn't affect government other governments as much. But any government that was strongly restructured and reformed around new public management, one of the unintended outcomes was what I call functional segmentation. So you had IT over there, you had policy over there, you had delivery over there, you had frontline over there, you have everyone got split up according to their discipline which meant that everyone had a different cost center, which means actually like that that divide then in the policy journey between design and delivery, um, and you know, I'm being very generalist right now, that divide between the different disciplines has is part of that culture issue, right? Because no one can talk to each other because they're all too busy doing the thing they need to do to then throw it over the fence to the next team, to then throw it over the fence, to throw it over the fence. So, it's not just cultural, it's also structural. Part of that culture is a, I just need to get it out the door and then it's not my problem. A lot of policy teams genuinely believe once they have got a decision, once they've got their ledger reg through the parliament, then their job is done. But of course, that's just the start from a policy journey perspective. Once you have a policy, the delivery of and the outcomes you're supposed to drive is actually where it's important, right? So policy people are disengaged from delivery. Delivery people are not engaged in design. And and um, yes, that's a problem. So how we started to overcome that broader problem is first of all, helping policy and drafters realize, which a lot of them didn't. I was very surprised to, to relate. When we started talking about rules as code, a lot of people said, if you put the rules into code, you're going to have all these problems. And so the first realization was, oh my gosh, you don't, realize that everything you do is coded today <laughs> like we're like you realize every business system out there that is using your rules has put it into code so all of your concerns about it being encoded it already it's already happening the difference with what we're proposing with rules as code is that it's transparent consistently applied a consistent interpretation that's that's available right that, so you can test back against it and they're like oh so a lot of people in, didn't realize they had a problem when you point out the problem that they have they got a lot more interested to try. The second thing is a lot of people have had a very bad experience with IT. And I understand this. I really do. You know, they try to talk to IT. IT tells them, you know, all kinds of problems. There's, there's again, structural and cultural problems there. So getting them in a room with a developer and a design person and a data person, and you know, actually, and then having them having a good experience was very new for them. So for a lot of them, we had to convince them based on relationships to start. But once they started, they couldn't unsee it, and now they're addicted. So what we found is that policy professionals and drafters um, sort of come in a little bit tentative and a little bit hesitant, but very rapidly can see the benefits to the policy, the benefits to the rules, and the benefits to the outcomes. And suddenly they feel empowered because the key thing is they have actually been very disempowered, particularly the drafters. Drafters are caught in the middle between policy makers who, who draft instructions that may or may not be any good and delivery people and everyone loves to blame the drafters but um so this is a way to re-empower them um to your so consumption right now the general public tries if they can to read legislation to understand their rights and they can't it's it's impenetrable it's, it's hard to understand so any tools that you can make so in new zealand there is a major not-for-profit that provides services to the most vulnerable in new zealand and they did a project called Benefit Me in collaboration with civil society. Uh, and Benefit Me just takes the Social Services uh, Act, which is the eligibility criteria for social services, and makes it available as an app to say, what are you eligible for? Um, this is what the law says you're eligible for. And if the Social Services Department gives you a different answer, here's how the law empowers you to ask for an explanation. Now, of course, what's interesting about that is the department can easily say, well, but, but, but maybe, but you're not authoritative. And the simple truth is that there's no such thing as authoritative rules as code um, unless it's been tested in the court. So even the department's implementation of rules as code is not authoritative because it hasn't been tested in court, right? So then we could say, well, great, where did we get it wrong? 
and they couldn't point out anywhere we got it wrong. But then they said, well, you don't have any operational policy. And we got to ask the very difficult question, are you suggesting your operational policy conflicts with the law? And of course, that made the department go, holy moly, and lots of expletives, and I'll just I'll just um, leave it with you as to why that was so interesting. Um, so it's actually it actually creates when you start making law as code and make it interactable and you can build tools around it that people can start to play with and understand their rights, um, their access and then be able to. And this is important. Hold everyone, including government departments, to ensure that their rights are actually being upheld um, to your other questions. Consultation. Um, on the projects I've been involved in, we tried to get consumers of those rules involved. Sometimes that was end, pub, end user public, sometimes it's regulated entities, so that was helpful. But you can just build that into your normal process. I don't think that has to be a new process. And um, in terms of um, jurisdictional, um, um, look, I've only I've only done this work in four jurisdictions so far, and all of them are fairly similar, um, case law based, etc. I would suggest that um, most jurisdictions will have some rules that are um, that are suitable for this at least but in any case there are international rules that are suitable for this which is why the international um, trade uh, codification is actually quite interesting because if you can actually get consistency of trade um, rules of I mean all of the anti-money laundering counterterrorism fin financing rules come from FATF the oh gosh financial anti-terrorism force or something whatever it is FATF those global rules are not defined anywhere. So every jurisdiction has to write and interpret their own. But imagine if more of those international rules were available. Imagine if GDPR was available as a reference implementation that anyone <laughs> could then consume. So I think that there is some benefit, not just at a jurisdictional level, but looking at an international level where there are shared rules. Thank you, Financial Action Task Force. I knew the F, the second F started for something. Um, so um, I, I hope that was a very brief answer to all four of your questions. Christopher. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, <clears throat> Christopher Olsen from the Agency for Digital Government in Denmark. Uh, this is a question to Professor Hotner um, about data, specifically the integration of data in the Catala uh, platform or, or Syntax. Uh, it, it, as far as I could tell or understand, it wasn't covered specifically how you, uh, you know, I saw, understand the Syntax and the logic and so on. I uh, just didn't get very much and I can look into it, of course. I'm just wondering. In our experience, when we draft legislation increasingly based on you know register data, we come to the realization that the successful outcome of the legislation or the rules is very dependent on the quality of the data that you put us in as a premise. And therefore, perhaps in the future, we need to be even more uh, you know pro pro proactive in prototyping uh, the rules to see how they actually work out with data in sets of data. And and I would be curious to hear about specifically relative to Catella, uh, if it actually you know. The reference to to a variable you make can it actually be integrated? You know, is is there some kind of provision for it to actually take data from an existing data set of some kind, a file or a database or whatever? That would be my, my first question. And then just following up briefly on that, it seems to me syntactically, uh, Catala is very close to natural language or at least legal drafting language. And I'm wondering if you have done any thoughts about that yourself uh, about whether using a specific language, domain specific language would make it easier for tools like generative AI or cross compilers to take uh, natural language like drafted articles as input and then provide the catalyst as output in an almost real time, you know, to facilitate drafting. I understand you envisioned use cases to have a lawyer and a coder next to each other, but tomorrow might it be feasible to imagine an AI tool to, to, to do that for you if, if the other scenario is not immediately possible? Those were my questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. These are really interesting questions. So the first uh, question on data quality. So the first thing, uh, Catala is not uh, machine learning based, so we don't have exactly the same issues uh, than when you have a machine learning tool. Um, so basically we use the same idea that governments use for tax collection, collection meaning that we let people uh, use their own data if they want to like put input their own data into Catala. Um, and well, because we are not the government, we don't really care if it's true or false. Obviously, if it were to be used by administration and by government, you have ways of checking if the data is correct through uh, interconnection and asking banks and asking employers and also this kind of thing. So that would obviously go into this like vast structure, um, institutional structure to check it. That's the first thing. And second, on, on the question of um, 
of AI. So we, we did try to use a large language model to, um, to translate the law and it was a complete failure. So I'm not saying that, so I, as you may have understood, I'm a strong defendant of the idea of, um, of technology, like technology around human and the importance of human decision and human judgment in technologies and in the law and in justice. So my opinion is the way we do it is quite cool and I want to keep that in that way now. And also it doesn't work anyway with machine learning and AI. Maybe if it evolves and it changes and it works well, technically it could be feasible. I'm not entirely sure, but I don't know. We never know what, what technology can, can, can be. But the way the European law is, is created now is really to ensure that the law is only applied by humans. And I'm not sure that a law that is translated by a machine and then applied to human could be legal in the framework of the GDPR, the AI Act, and all the things that are going to come uh, in, the European, um, in the European Union legislation. So this is why I think Catella is quite, is quite a good tool because we focus on, I think the question of value is really there, is what do we want from technologies? Um, and even if we can do it, does it mean that we should do it? We are a tiny bit behind time, but if we may end with this question that just appeared in the chat, uh, Pia, may I ask your view on the Catala approach? I see that Catala seems to start from existing legal text, but still intends to come up with a reference implementation. So, Pia. Um, yeah, look, I was just typing a detailed response. Um, look, there's two things here. First of all, I, I can't express to you all enough the urgency and pressure to get to draw a line in the sand at some point so that we don't have to keep drafting rules after the legislation and regulation has been drafted. This is the sort of group that could say, at some point, let's draw a line in the sand and all new legislation and regulation should be drafted as machine and human readable from the start, not just to get a machine readable version as a reference implementation from the start, but also to get better drafted rules in the first place, right? Test driven drafting. So I, I just want to very quickly reiterate that that is the biggest pressure because I have seen many, many tools, uh, I've used many tools um, that try to, uh, that do codify what already exists. But if you get too distracted with that and end up putting 100% of your rules as code effort on just codifying what's being produced through the sausage machine, we're still going to get bad sausages being produced. <laughs> so, so please make sure that at least some of your focus and effort goes into fixing how the sausages are made so that we don't keep producing terrible sausages. Um, so to Catalan, um, like, first of all, I haven't had a chance to have a good look at it. It looks fantastic. I really love um, everything that was being said around it's important to not just automate the generation using machine learning, uh, the machine learning and NLP solutions that I have um, seen and tried and uh, observed um, always produce bad outcomes that need like enormous human interpretation anyway. Uh, quite often they will produce just Boolean after Boolean that uh, and non reconsumable or reusable um, libraries or artifacts or components or, or definitions. Um, quite often there's a huge amount of human interpretation, well, interpretation that needs to happen anyway. You know, does 18 mean from midnight or does it mean from this or, you know, and so it, it doesn't actually take so much effort to codify it. Um, and I feel like people are getting caught up on the shiny tools. I saw a Gen AI, you know, push legislation in and the Gen AI just produced another version of the pros. Gen AI doesn't create anything logical. It just creates a mashup, a synthesis of whatever you feed it. So I am very afraid of the people I have heard. I've heard policymakers say, we can use Gen AI to create new policy. And I've had to um, talk to them about how Gen AI, by definition, gives you a synthesis of the status quo policy is meant to drive a change from the status quo. So unless you want policy that's going to create more of the same, at which point why have the policy at all, then you probably shouldn't be using Gen AI to create new policy. Um, so I think people don't realize that it doesn't take that much effort to codify rules. Um, and so they're looking for shiny, rapid, fast ways because they're assuming it's going to take so much effort, but it doesn't. If it's just pure rules as code, 
Um, a human involved in the interpretation and decision making about that is, is helpful. Using an NLP, um, sorry, natural learning processing and other sort of tools can help a little bit if you want to do heaps of it, but you still need to have a human review and make the calls and ensure and check back with policy that the interpretations of definitions is actually as they should be. Um, and the fact is that a lot of policy, a lot of legislation and regulation is drafted in a way that doesn't make sense from a machine's perspective anyway. So if you make it, if you like linear, do this, then this, then this, and this, then it doesn't work. But if you can say, here are the, the 10 conditions you need to meet, then your test case either meets the conditions or it doesn't. You don't need to say, ask about this and then ask about this and then ask about this. So you run the risk of getting, of recreating um, the unnecessary complexity of the drafting when you just feed it in and, and pull it out. Does that make sense? But I'm going to yeah. go look at this particular solution because I, I try to keep across all these tools and um, and there are some, and, and everything I heard sounded really great. Well, thank you so much. I suggest we leave it at that since we are truly out of time now. Thank you to both of you for coming for the presentations and for answering all our questions. In terms of next step, uh, we actually encourage you to also sign up for the CEMIC online. It's also in Madrid, but you can no longer register for in-person, but the online conference on the 17th and 18th of October. And as always, we would like it if you could also subscribe to our new newsletter and become a member of our community. We will, of course, send you an email with all the resources, the PowerPoints and the um, recording for today after the event. So thank you so much to all of you for coming and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank man. you. Thanks for organizing Thank this. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thanks. Thank you.